and uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to uh, to talk in this series as well and uh, particularly about a subject which I really enjoy which is using cover crops um, to try and suppress plant parasitic nematodes. So I'm going to try and talk to you about a number of different topics during this uh, session and uh, just to say that a lot of the topics that I'm discussing have been supported by PhD students, past and presents, and also um, colleagues of mine. So the general outline is really just for those people who are not uh, so familiar with plant parasitic nematodes to give a bit of an introduction to those, to uh, just think about cover crops and some general considerations if you're uh, looking to include those to try and suppress your, your nematodes. And then to, to go through um, what types of activity is out there from these, these various cover crops. So uh, this, this will provide us with a, a bit of background uh, to see uh, how, how these nematodes are being suppressed. Then we'll um, move on to looking at one type of cover crop, which is a biofumigant. So we'll talk about some work that we've done in the past on, on biofumigant brassicas, and then go on to uh, talking about a number of different types of trap crops and just finish with um, some general conclusions about it all. So on this slide, we've got all sorts of images relating to nematodes and the damage that they do and should say that not all nematodes uh, are bad. A lot of nematodes um, actually are very important in terms of agriculture and soil functioning, uh, but there are a proportion of those nematodes which um, are parasitic to plants and can cause various types of damage. So there's around 4,100 plant parasitic nematodes known in the world. And these um, nematodes um, can vary in terms of the way that they survive, um, the way that they produce symptoms. A lot of them are found below ground in um, the soil environment. Nematodes are aquatic organisms and, and need the soil moisture. Um, so roots, tubers can be damaged, but there are also nematodes that can cause damage to foliage as well. So some, some foliar nematodes do exist too. One of the big problems, of course, with nematodes is that if you have nematode feeding, nematode feeding can, can damage roots irreparably. So we can see in the central top image there, which shows you a, a bean field that's heavily infested with stem nematodes and that can lead to yield loss. And worldwide, the figure that's often given is around 14% of total crop production is lost because of, of nematode damage. But nematodes also um, affect quality. Uh, we can see an example of that um, in the top left with the tuber there that is infected with root knot nematode. And we can see the blemishing beneath the surface and there can be also unsightly galls associated with um, these nematodes. But other nematodes can cause other sorts of damage, like we've got a number of nematodes that will feed on roots and cause fanged and deformed roots. Um, and, and there are indeed other symptoms. The other problem, of course, is um, that nematodes can be vectors of viruses. And we can see an example of that in the image in the top right there, that's um, Sprang, tobacco rattle virus, and that can cause unsightly blemishes, arcs in the flesh of potatoes, not what you want if you're trying to produce chips or crisps. And then, of course, seed contamination. A lot of nematodes can adhere to tubers, um, bulbs, as we can see here. This is uh, a stem nematode down at the bottom. We can see a uh, a, a narcissus bulb that's infected with stem nematodes and that's a way in which those nematodes could be transferred. And one of the big problems at the moment, one of the real worries, um, particularly in the UK and elsewhere, is that we have 
very stringent um, legislation with regards to pesticides. So we're rapidly losing the chemicals that can be used to treat these nematodes. Um, here in the UK, I can think of crops that are without nematicides or crops where we are sort of relying on one product or the products that are behind those are not really um, going to be a substitute for those more um, powerful products. So this is a, a reason why we are looking at these alternatives um, through cover cropping. Now, the one thing I would say to you in general about cover cropping is never generalize. Um, different cover crops have different activities. They're not a solution for every type of nematode. And if you use them incorrectly, it could lead to problems. Certainly, if you use them in the right way, they can take out a good fraction or, of, of the population of nematodes um, in, in the soil. And, and that can mean that if you're using a resistant variety and a variety that doesn't have tolerance, then you're you, working with variety and um, trying to reduce the population is, 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 a, is a good measure. The other thing is that, of course, cover crops we know bring additional soil benefits um, in that some of them are very good at scavenging for nutrients if you're growing brassicas. Some of them may fix nitrogen if they're legumes, and some of them are going to add, or a lot of them are going to add organic matter to the soil um, and um, improve drainage if they're very deep rooting. The other thing is that there's an opportunity to, to do some of this work with suppressing nematodes through environmental stewardship programs. And if you were to look at the new environment land management schemes, you would see cover crops mentioned there. And some of those cover crops fit with what are cover crops for suppressing nematodes. And we will continue to, to, to engage with DEFRA to try and make sure that there is an opportunity to, to do dual purpose activities with these, these cover crops. As I said, it, it is important to select your cover crops um, based upon the problems that are in your field. That means sampling for nematodes, knowing what's there and applying the strategies carefully. It, it, it could be quite easy to, to just pick a mixture of cover crops and, and think that you were doing the right thing but actually um, some nematodes will use those cover crops as a host and that could lead to an elevation of problems. Cover crops definitely should be regarded as part of an IPM strategy. As I said, you're trying to reduce part of that population so that strategies that are used later on, um, the reliance on them is, is taken away and that they work synergistically with those other strategies, whether that be um, different types of chemical control, uh, varietal resistance, um, rotation, all the sorts of things you'd think about in an IPM program. Now, this is a bit of a guide to what um, cover crops can do. So if we look at the top, first of all, we've got um, cover crops, which um, if I just get my pointer, Yeah, so we've got cover crops which um, are regarded as being resistant. These are trap crops, really. So these are plants that um, nematodes recognize as a host. They produce the signals from the roots. They, uh, the leachates are stimulating them. The nematodes will invade those plants, but they're resistant plants. So they're feeding uh, sites, uh, specialised feeding sites known as sin situ or giant cells do not develop. So the, the life cycle is halted and there's no production of females. So you reduce the population. Obviously, this is what we don't want to do is to introduce a cover crop that's a great host, a susceptible host and increase populations of nematodes. Uh, a, a part of a strategy may be to um, use uh, a, a cover crop which is regarded as a poor host. So for example, 
um, black oats are used for reducing root lesion nematodes because they're they are hosts but they're poor hosts so this leads to a reduced multiplication of the nematodes and then we've got um, hosts that just just using hosts that are not hosts for nematodes which means that nematodes are not stimulated as such um, so the decline rate of the nematodes whilst those cover crops are there should go down. We've got biofumigants and, and I'll be talking to you about more, those more in more detail in a moment so I'll come back to those and there are also plants which produce um, nematicidal compounds and there are various types of these plants um, so for example marigolds um, have been used in the past to treat root lesion nematodes these marigolds are uh, a ho act like a host for the root lesion nematodes, but when the, the nematodes damage the roots, um, a compound called alpha terephenol is, is produced, which is nematicidal to those nematodes and therefore reduces them. If you're using um, plants like from the legume family, such as um, lucerne, which is also known as alfalfa, you, you get um, production of this chemical, which is a uh, type of saponin, um, and those um, have effects on suppressing nematodes. In warmer climates, you could be looking at growing uh, plants like Sudan grass or um, sorghum. And the way that these plants work is that um, the nematodes are attracted to the roots of these plants and when they feed upon them, um, they activate a reaction. So there's a, a precursor, which is known as durin. And this is um, when the cells are damaged, um, durin comes in contact with durinase, which releases hydrogen cyanide, which kills the nematodes. So it could be used as a type of trap crop but also if you were to chop and macerate that material, you would get the same effect. And it's rather like a, a, a biofumigant, a brassica biofumigant. Okay, let's just stop that and go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, so next slide is about biofumigation. A lot of people have heard me talk about biofumigants, but for those for people who are not so familiar with them, biofumigants, um, brassica biofumigants are um, so members of the brassica family that um, produce high quantities of a compound called glucosinolates inside them. And these glucosinolates, they're glucose-based molecules that are inert when they're intact. So we can see in this diagram here um, how these cells are containing uh, certain cells are containing glucosinolates in their vacuoles. Now, when you damage these plants, you release from separate cells um, myrosinase. And when myrosinase and glucosinolates combine in the presence of water, water is very important because the reaction is, it's a hydrolysis reaction. It gives you uh, leads to the breakdown of those glucosinolates. So the glucose is cleaved off to leave behind an unstable A glycone um, and hydrogen sulfate. And then that unstable A glycone converts to an array of different volatile organic compounds. And most research has been done on the isothiocyanates. These are the longer chain molecules and they persist. Uh, longer in soil. So these are biocidal compounds. So this process could be achieved by um, growing plants to this point. You can see in this field, they're all in flower. This is when the glucosinolate concentrations are at their highest. And then you would chop um, using a, a flail, a mower, and then uh, quickly incorporate those residues um, whilst they're releasing their gases and the gases are what you are affecting your, your target organisms. And the soil pH is, is important if the, um, the pH is um, of a low um, pH, if it's acidic, if it's certainly below five, then you can get more nitriles. So these are other types of volatile organic compounds. These nitriles are also 
biocidal, but they are um, very quick to um, volatilize and disappear from the soil. And biofumigation can, can be achieved either through the cover crop, as you can see here, but it also could be achieved by applying preserved products in the form of defatted seed mills. Um, some people have cut biofumigants and created a type of hay and use this cut and carry system, uh, or also um, liquid formulations whereby defatted seed mills are combined with vegetable oil and fed through drip irrigation. And that's been used to treat um, nematodes like root knot nematodes on tomatoes in Italy. So I have a few things which I often say when I'm talking about biofumigants is that the process is inherently variable. People may have very good success with it. It's possible to get reductions. In some of our studies, we've had reductions up to 90% of um, potato cyst nematodes, but in other studies, um, you know, you may not have an effect or the um, suppression is much lower than that, could be down as low as 20%. So the variability of the process is to do with a number of different things. The first thing is to understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to grow your plants for maximum chemistry, maximum glucosinolate content. And there's a number of things which affect that. The second thing is that you're trying to grow those plants to have as, as much material as possible. So you want to maximize the biomass. The choice of biofumigant is important in terms of species, but also the cultivar that you use. And there are a number of brassicas that produce high quantities of glucosinolates but it's all about um, their profile of glucosinolates and what those glucosinolates then are converted to in terms of isothiocyanates, because there are lots of glucosinolates out there. There's around 132 um, glucosinolates uh, known, and not all of those produce isothiocyanates, which are of use in biofumigation. So choice of species is important. But that you know, variety uh, species like Indian mustard, oilseed radish, rocket um, will work. But there are other species that are less effective for, for biofumigation purposes. And then um, the management of how you grow those biofumigants is also important. Key thing really is about. Um, making sure that you select a site which it doesn't have low pH, that um, you sow during the summer months. If you're particularly you're growing a crop like Indian mustard, you want to be growing from June, July onwards, um, which is difficult in the rotation. I appreciate that. Um, but by starting at this particular time, um, the plants will accumulate higher glucosinolates because Plants respond to higher radiation, longer day length, higher temperatures, etc. You start to sow later, you're not going to get those effects. Nutrients are important, and I have got data on this if, if anyone is interested. Um, nitrogen, um, obviously for, for biomass, but also sulfur is important for raising the concentration of glucosinolates. And we've done a study where we've increased um, uh, sulfur incrementally, and then actually seeing that suppression being shown on, uh, or the, the effects um, being transferred in suppression of the nematodes. Cutting time, um, don't leave it too late, essentially. Don't leave it until the soil temperatures cool below eight degrees C, because this doesn't help with the movement of gases. So aiming for a cutting time in, in the UK of around um, September to October, if possible, you know, once we start to get to where we are now, it's, it's a little late. Also, um, a, a student of mine, William Watts, he did a lot of work on different implements and uh, the way that you cut and you incorporate. Um, so it is important to select the right kit. But one thing I would say is that um, everything has to be done in quick succession. So you flail mow, you rotivate, and then ideally you seal the soil um, in one pass. Or if you've, if you've got, you can't do that with one 
set of machinery, um, you have two tractors uh, running in succession. And also the soil needs to be moist at incorporation. Now, there are various suppressive effects that occur during biofumigation. First of all, um, we've no noticed that we get an effect even before you chop and incorporate um, the Nebraskas. And this is known as partial biofumigation. And the, the reason why this works is that there are, the, the brassicas will leach glucosinolates into the soil and there are lots of micro, um, myrosinase producing microorganisms in the soil that break down those glucosinolates. Admittedly, this is uh, low concentration, so, um, but, but for long exposure times, and we do see suppression under crops even before you get to the point of doing this, which is the full biofumigation part. And then finally, um, there is an organic effect in that if you're adding all this material to the soil, you create a substrate for um, microorganisms that are suppressive to your pests and pathogens. And this was observed in um, some work that Australian researcher John Kierkegaard did with bacterial wilt. Um, so after effects of, of the organic matter going into the soil. Uh, this is just, I'm just showing you some evidence really of um, biofumigants working. And, and one of our first studies was with um, a student called Bruno Engala, who, who now works in France. And this was on PCN. And the measurement on the, the um, y-axis is viable Globidura pallida eggs um, per gram of soil. So it's looking at um, not just counting eggs, but uh, determining the viability of the juveniles within the eggs. And we can see here different um, graphs relating to uh, different periods. So pre drilling, pre incorporation, and six weeks post incorporation. We've got three different brassicas compared to the untreated. So Aruca sativa is rocket. Uh, Raphana sativus is radish, Brassica juncea is Indian mustard. And one of the interesting things with this work was this is where we observed this effect pre-incorporation, where we got a suppression of um, PCN even before those um, plants had been chopped up, which we were really surprised with. But when we did um, some research, um, desk-based research, we saw that there was a reason why this was happening. And then Bruno conducted some further work in the glasshouse, and it's a lovely study um, which shows um, that um, you can prove that there are um, there is elevated activity uh, that leads elevated microbial activity that leads um, to the breakdown of glucosinolates, and then hence the reduction of um, the nematodes in the soil. So that's a that's a whole new story and actually we have a new PhD on this next year a new a, a new studentship um, to look at this further so if Bruno's listening will be very pleased to hear about that. Now I'm going to talk about some work that um, a student of mine uh, and um, some other supervisors at Harper Adam have um, been supervising Nasamu Musa and he's been looking at um, stem nematodes. So these are nematodes that affect beans. They cause um, swellings, uh, distortions of the stems of beans. And one thing that was interesting in the Samu's work is that um, he has seen that uh, one of the one of the isophyocyanates, which we suspected would perhaps be more biocidal, more effective. Um, was less biocidal when we looked when he did mortality assays. Um, but an observation that he made was yes, some of the lower concentrations don't um, kill the nematodes, but it does affect the behavior, the movement of those nematodes. And we can see here in these um, slides, uh, these are root tips, uh, excised root tips of uh, field bean. And we can see um, the nematodes being applied to pleuronic gel around the root tips at 24 hours, 48 hours, and 96 hours. And you can see how 
the stem nematodes congregate around the roots, uh, forming this sort of the typical wall. Um, and it's an interesting uh, observation anyway, because um, the nematodes are uh, typically associated with the foliage of the bean. So to see them attracted to the roots in this way was interesting from a nematology point of view. Now, if we look at this, this very low concentration of allyl ITC, uh, we can see that over that time, we're, we're just not seeing the movement. The nematodes are alive, but they are not congregating around the roots in the same way. Similarly, um, if we look a bit more detail of his work, um, we can see that um, the various isothiocyanates have different effects on the body form of the nematodes. So if we look here, we can see within the control um, plates, we've got all of our nematodes alive and they're, most of them have got a normal form. There's a few that um, were dead. Uh, and if you compare that with a heated control, then obviously we get a lot of them that are paralyzed um, showing that straight shape. Now, if we look at allyl, we can see that um, these lower concentrations, which you could have written off really in the mortality assays are actually showing quite a lot of nematodes that are either sort of showing a paralyzed form with a high concentration and the lower concentrations, the 12.5 and 6.25 parts per million, we can see um, a lot of affected and coiled nematodes. And this was much more pronounced. So even though allyl was, let's say, less biocidal than some other um, isothiocyanates like 2-phenyl, ethyl and benzyl, um, it, in terms of what it does to the body shape and the movement of the nematodes, which I'm going to come on to, it has some interesting effects. So, and this is just to show you um, this some videos that Nasamu took showing you the lovely uh, sigmoidal patterns that uh, sinusoidal patterns that uh, nematodes have when they're not uh, treated with isothiocyanates. And this is a relatively low concentration. Whoops of um, allyl ITC, and you can see obviously the complete contrast. They're not dead, but they're not very happy at all. And a lot of them show these typical C shapes, Z shapes and J shapes, very, very slow moving. And then when we look at the movement of the nematodes, so this was some work that he did on looking how the nematodes move into a, an area around the zoot. So a one centimeter zone around the roots, you can see that um, when you look at the uh, controls and the heated control um, and looking at allyl, even with those low concentrations, again, um, very few nematodes are moving into that um, demarcated area um, when they're treated with that. And, and the point of showing you this is really to highlight that um, you could, you could rule out these, these sublethal effects, but they are important because a nematode can't find its host or orientate itself, then eventually it, it will die. Okay, so I want to move on now to another topic that we've been looking at, and that is solanaceous trap crops. So in the past, going back um, 20 years ago, there was a lot of interest in this plant here, which is um, sticky nightshade, Solanum sacimbrifolium, an awful plant to uh, deal with because of its horrible fawny structures that it produces, but an excellent trap crop for potato cyst nematodes. Now, there was some work that, uh, that was done recently in Kenya on other species of of trap crops, some African nightshades. So we were interested to further look at this and look at some, some other solanums. And one of my MSc students, um, Morvan Anderson, oh, this is just a quick uh, diagram showing what happens with trap crops. It shows you um, how juveniles invade the roots and go through different stages of development. We can see I just uh, get a pointer up here. We can see the feeding cell. We can see these different life stages and the nematodes feeding on the roots. And uh, what uh, the, your um, 
track crops don't do is that they affect that feeding site. They're resistant plants effectively, and they um, stop the, the, the females from developing, hence reduce the uh, multiplication of the nematodes in the soil. And going back to Morven's work, we did some work recently on this to, to compare um, these different novel solanaceous crops on how well they induced hatch um, in um, from potato cyst nematodes, which were grown in glasshouse pots. And uh, it was it was good to see, we can see the controls here, we can see the fallow pots and the potato, and obviously with the potato, we're getting a lot of hatch induction from um, sachets of uh, potato cysts, nematode cysts. And when we compare those with the other treatments, treatments one to um, six, which are other solanums, we can see that there are a lot of solanums there that have the potential to induce that hatch, but they're not going to lead to the multiplication of those nematodes. So some other work we've been doing, and this is work that's um, linked with the Soil Association, and it's involved a lot of different people. It's farmer-led research. It involves um, one of my old colleagues, um, Ivan Grove, who's done my, most of the field assessments, and also produce solutions who sell different cover crops. Um, we've been looking at um, the, the possibility of, of trying to understand why um, growers are less likely to, to use cover crops. One of the big problems has been um, issues around establishment. Um, so can we look at things that improve how these plants emerge and establish to get more reliable crops? But also with the advent of some of the newer species that have been researched like Solanum scabrum, which is the African nightshade, could we grow these later? Because Solanum sacimbrifolium would typically have to be grown from May through to October, which is not a great window um, for growers um, to try and try and get these, these, these plants into the rotation. So we've been looking at a number of things in, in, in this project. And one of the things I'd like to show you is really this was this was really looking at the um, at different sowing dates of Solanum sacimbrifolium and Solanum scabrum and, and different sowing depths. And what we've done is we've used the latest sowing date recommended and also a very late sowing date of um, late July. We want to just really see, um, firstly, could we, could, we, could we push the system? Could we get um, Solanum sacimbrifolium and scabrum to grow uh, at these later dates? And I think what the, the, the main answer is, if we look at particularly looking at this, this image, the aerial image down at the bottom there, they, this shows the two sowing dates, the um, June sowing date on the left and the um, July sowing date on the right is that um, the, the later sowing date, um, even though we've never grown Solanum scabrum in the UK, is, is clearly not um, going to be a possibility. But the um, latest date, if you like, the, the late June date is possible. And we were get, certainly getting um, reasonable levels of ground cover. The um, sowing depth wasn't uh, really having an effect on um, although I would say that the uh, lower uh, the sorry the um, sh more shallow sowing date uh, the sowing depth was, was was slightly better than the deeper sowing depth of, of three centimeters. Um, we were able to get a, a good cover. Um, however, we didn't get the dry matter that would be needed to get optimal hatch. There is a, a magic figure that was calculated by some Dutch re researchers, which is around 700 grams of dry matter per uh, meter squared. And we, we, we only um, managed to achieve um, less than 50% of that. So um, 
the, the, the areas of interest for us to look at now are, can we improve it by looking at factors like seed rates, um, early nitrogen, which is some work that we're doing uh, this year to try and um, improve that. But there are, there are a lot of other areas um, that, that, that can be looked at around um, these, these trap crops. They do have the potential to um, reduce PCM populations by between 75 and 85 percent, depending on the publication that you, you, you look at. Um, it's just about trying to improve on that variability problem again. And this is another crop. Um, this is um, with beet cyst nematodes. So beet cyst nematodes are nematodes that um, cause this bearding of um, sugar beets, you can see on the right hand side. Um, and uh, they can cause yield loss of up to 30%. And there are again, potential cover, uh, cover crops that can act as trap crops. And these are um, various types of radish and white mustard that are ranked as being class one or class two. Class one is highly resistant and class two is lower resistant. And in this experiment that was done by Alistair Wright, who um, I worked with on another PhD project, we can see that um, the radish, the class one radish and the class two mustard were able to uh, reduce the reproductive factor um, below one and we all really sort of I think probably quite familiar with reproductive factors during the times of, of, of COVID so effectively we're cutting the population by 50% by growing them and that's having a significant effect above the fallow. These other radishes that are given um, these different slightly lower ratings were not um, really any different from the susceptible radish and I would say that the susceptible radish is, is um, uh, neither, uh, it's, it's not multiplying the nematodes really, we look no real difference from the fallow. So some of these, these descriptions that you, you get associated with seed need to be looked at quite carefully. But certainly in, in this work, the um, class one radish and the class two mustard here did have good effects. And a, a class one radish has uh, the cost of um, Alistair cal calculated around £130 a hectare and that's all seed costs and establishment and he also worked out that you would need to get around six tonnes per hectare yield improvement to justify the cost. Well I think that given that um, beet cyst nematode can cause 30% losses then you could easily get your um, cost of um, growing these crops back um, in terms of uh, their use. So just to finish with, um, in terms of outlook, we certainly got a lot of work, a lot, there are a lot of options uh, with um, cover crops um, in the UK. Nematicide options are certainly reducing and therefore uh, we do need to uh, find alternatives. As I su suggested at the beginning, Cover crops need to be selected with care. You need to think about the types of nematodes that you have. Um, some nematodes, uh, sorry, some cover crops can be a good host for, for plant pathogenic nematodes and some nematodes are polyphagous. Um, for example, root lesion nematodes. And also if you're growing cover crops, you need to, to some extent, really sort of treat them like crops. You've got to establish them, you've got to grow them, and you've got to incorporate them with care. And that's certainly true with um, PCN trap crops, and it's certainly true with biofumicants. What about the future? Well, I think these um, environment land management schemes in the UK are really interesting for, for cover crops. And one way in which we can incentivize growing cover crops for nematodes is by having them involved in schemes or a part of schemes. And already I can see some potential in these schemes which are being piloted this year and, and rolled out um, further next year um, and established in the, in the future. And certainly can see uh, one part, which is the Sustainable Farming Initiative, 
uh, which is all about increasing soil organic matter with cover crops, which uh, could link to um, nematode suppression. But I've also heard that um, integrated pest management will form as part of ELMS. So again, that's another opportunity uh, for potentially um, incentivizing these cover crops for um, use uh, for nematode management. This is just a final uh, slide just to show that we have done a guide on uh, biofumigation for PCN and you can, can easily access from the, this from the AHDB. Uh, this was written by Bill Watts and myself, and uh, it uh, goes through various facets that affect uh, biofumigant production. So finally, I would just like to say thank you to a number of people, particularly uh, PhD students that um, I've worked with in the past and people that I'm working with in the present. We're still carrying on a lot of our work on, on, on cover crops and um, there's still plenty to do in terms of um, various ways in which we can reduce this variation and looking at the exploitation of cover crops in um, for different types of, of crops. Also I'd like to thank funders, um, growers and agronomists that have assisted me in projects in the past and also for the opportunity to speak and thank you all for, for listening to me. That's great. Thank you very much, Matt. A lot of interesting stuff there. That's for sure. OK, so we've got a few questions, a uh, few actually uh, hands up. So let me ask, I'm going to unmute Karen if you want to ask a, ask a question to Matt, if you're there. Maybe not. OK, let's, uh, let's go to a question on uh, on the Q&A, first of all, then Matt, there's a few there as well. So question from Abdul Memon. He asks, uh, did you use mycorrhizae, uh, mycorrhizae to protect plants from nematode infection? And, and secondly, you can, cha you can change microbiome of plants to protect uh, plants from uh, nematode infection. Um, yeah, so have you looked at those options, I guess? Okay, um, I, I must admit, I, not me personally, I've not um, done any work on mycorrhizae, um, although it, it was something that um, have become interested in, uh, particularly for nematodes of crops like um, carrots and parsnips. Uh, as the, well, that, that mycorrhizae was suggested as, a, as, as one of the options you could, you could look at. And I'd be particularly interested in, in looking at how mycorrhizae interact with different resistant plants. So whether there's some synergy there um, in using mycorrhizae, but yeah, certainly um, mycorrhizae are interesting. We, we have done some work at Harper, not that I was involved with in, in the past um, and shown that uh, mycorrhizae were, we, were useful um, and could be used alongside nematicides for reducing PCM. And then the other one was about the microbiome, and I think that's a really interesting question. Um, so going back to this partial biofumigation idea, uh, one thing that I would like to look at in the future is, is how we can manipulate that, that microbiome, either by um, changing the activity of plant exudation or um, seeding the soil with the right type of substrates to raise the right types of microbes within that microbiome to elevate suppressiveness to get the, the right type of players that um, produce myrosinase. So this is specifically around that partial biofumigation idea. But I think that's a yeah a really interesting uh, possibility. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe a, a bit, slightly more basic question here from uh... Rajendran, and he asked many terminology used to describe crops like cover crops or trap crops or antagonistic crop crops. Are these all the same thing or are there are differences between them? Yeah, that, that, that's a, it's an unfortunate thing with some of these um, different terms. So yeah, cover crops is a very generic term, of course, you know, we, we, we can be many things like that, but um, uh, catch crops, it's all really about sort of trying to trap or capture um, nutrients. Um, 
I mean, trap trap crops are, you know, in terms of, uh, of nematodes, are really sort of uh, plants that we consider dead end hosts. Um, they're, they're resistant plants, essentially. They're, they're plants that are hosts, but they're resistant so that they have a mechanism that prevents the development of the nematode feeding cells. Uh, I can't remember if I've missed one off of these. No, list. no, that's, I think that's fine. I think that's good. So um, I'm going to bring in um, Vadim in a moment, but let me just quickly ask a question from Raymond Julius, first of all. He says, what do you think about extracting the nemicidal compounds from cover crops and then applying on seeds before or after sowing? Is that is that a possible route, do you think? I think, it, I mean, it, it certainly is a, a, a possibility. Um, a number of people have gone down that route. And if you think really... Uh, about some old synthetic nematicides a lot of, you know when we talk about isothiocyanates a lot of those uh, fumigants were isothiocyanate based um, methyl isothiocyanate for instance in the past um, product metam was was used and there are other examples of fumigants that have had that in terms of um, whether there's been any sort of work on trying to get like a like a pure product I know that some of um, the American scientists have looked at trying to um, get a very sort of pure powder from biofumigants that's very rich in isothiocyanates and applying that to the soil. I think the, the problem is, is that when you start to go down that route, at the moment, you can, you can say that I'm cover cropping, but you're also, of course, um getting this sort of beneficial suppressive effect on organisms once you start to get into extracting something it then becomes about pesticide registration which is a, a, an unnecessary hurdle i see i see okay so um vadim i've uh, allowed you to unmute if you want to ask a question if you're there maybe not we're getting a lot of accidental hands potentially i think um so oh let me oh no that's wrong oh, let, so let me ask a, a quick question then Matt. so mm -hmm. um what sort of uh so what's the extent of the cover crops that you have to put in so are you having cover crops um on one field to one versus your you know um, economic crops or are they are they being planted out of season so it sounds though you're a lot of these are being planted yeah around, around yeah season. so are they around the edges or are they in separate fields no 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 so they're um they're within the rotation and they can be used in the they don't have to be right next to the crop that you're trying to protect okay so um you could you could use them wherever in the right you know think about um a lot of nematodes survive as maybe cysts, as juveniles, and your population will, will go up as you grow susceptible plants in that soil. So you've got this almost like um, overdraft that you're trying to reduce. Mm -hmm. So when you grow within your rotation, a trap crop or a biofumigant, you've reduced some of that um, debt of nematodes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think I've ever talked about nematodes in terms of um, overdrafts. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking it was about the scale, though. So obviously yeah. these nematodes can move, but maybe not huge distances. So if you have them in adjacent fields, is that sufficient to lure them away from your economic crops, for example? Or do they need to be closer together? Yeah, you've got you, 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 nematodes are... Um, patchy within fields so okay. you it is it's it, you won't get them migrating um adjacently from different fields so it is about yeah field specific um control and application of these so yeah you're looking at intercrops really with these 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 types of crops and as i said one of the big problems has just been around um trying to get these crops into the rotation because they just start there's just not the intervals, the opportunities. So this is why I'm hopeful that these schemes may be incentivizing growers to actually grow cover crops. And then if those cover crops, um, the, the types of cover crops coincide with them being trap or cover crops. And we we talk to uh, DEFRA, um, so colleagues of mine uh, and my, you know, I do as well. And we're hoping that we can sort of 
integrate a lot of this you know they're, they're, they're using the right terminology but they all, it also needs to be joined up with some of the work that's being done on these crops that could be quite useful and you know a grower is ach achieving two goals essentially yeah yeah well who knows well, i think so we'll leave it there maybe in the future we'll have we'll have gene editing uh, wheat intercropped with uh, uh, nemocidal um uh, cover crop or something and that would be perfect to bring these talks together that would be that would be great it's uh okay so let me thank you you both so thanks sarah for, for coming back on now uh, thanks very much matt thanks very much sarah for uh, for giving your talks. Thank to everyone who attended and, and asked uh, questions as well. It was really, really nice to have that uh, discussion there. So as I said, these have been recorded and I'll, and, and I'll put them on the, the AAB website of the next uh, day or so, so you can um, pass them on to any colleagues who, who missed them. So, uh, so thanks very much. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the, for the